can never just quite predict when that uh, rush of emotion is going to hit you. That was beautiful. Thank you. And I think you're beautiful too. I want to add my thanks to uh, everyone who uh, participated with the uh, special Christmas offering in December. We had about 30 um, uh, families in the church who, who gave to that in one shape or another, which uh, is an average of almost $275 each who, who gave to that. So uh, it really uh, gives us a, a, a great starting point for our church uh, financially next year uh, to uh, springboard from. So thank you so much, and we just are looking forward to uh, uh, a great year together. I also want to uh, uh, give a thank you to everyone who uh, gave uh, my wife and I Christmas cards uh, for the holidays. Uh, you, many of you wrote personal notes, very uh, very thoughtful and, and nice uh, notes. Uh, many of you gave us gifts uh, of various kinds, and we just really appreciate that, and especially the sweets, the cookies and the treats. Although I have to say how, how disappointed I am with those of you who uh, gave uh, cookies and sweets to me anonymously. Um, I need to know who to blame for my holiday weight gain. And uh, if you gave it anonymously, I, I don't know who to blame. So that's, uh, that's a problem. Let's work on that in the future. And uh, that'll be great. Did you have a good holiday? The Lord bless you. I hope so. And... Um, Already 2015, hard to believe, isn't it? Well, uh, much has changed, but some things have not changed. I still like to have a, a little trivia before my sermons. And uh, this is in, in, uh, designed for the, the kids in the congregation to have an opportunity to participate. And uh, by the way, I'm not sure exactly what it means, but when the children were taking up the offering and I was sitting on front, I was saying hi to some of the kids and as... Toby walked by. I said, hi, Toby. And he went like this. I, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but uh, I thought they waited to about 13 before they did that. But uh, they start early, I guess. Oh, boy. So the trivia is for the, for the kids, and I'd love to have their participation. I think these are all multiple choice, so uh, your, your odds go up in, in getting a correct answer here. Number one, what were Moses and the Israelites commanded to build um, after they came out of slavery in Egypt? Was it uh, a great big tower that everyone could live in? Was it a great big boat to save the world from a flood? Was it a portable sanctuary? Or was it a big wooden horse to deceive the Trojans? How well do you know your Bibles? Okay, I see. Well, I'm going to go with Peyton back there. The Trojan horse, that's right. No, I'm just kidding. I heard you. Yes, it was a portable sanctuary. That's right. God wanted them to build, uh, it, was, it was called the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. Uh, it was to be portable because they were not yet established in the promised land. They needed to be able to pack it up and move it. But God said, uh, let's get it built. Number two, since they were just wandering strangers at the time, how were they supposed to build this portable sanctuary? Did everyone have to chip in? Did God specifically appoint certain workmen as leaders? Was it because they had plunder from Egypt to help from the supplies or all of the above? Caleb doesn't want to do it this time. <laughs> All right. Oh, Caleb, how'd you know? Wow, he's a smart boy. All of the above. Isn't that right? God gave them uh, leaders to do it. He expected everyone to participate in some way. And, you know, they, uh, they had the plunder from Egypt. They had taken as much as they could when they left, and uh, they were going to use it to help build this sanctuary. All right, number three. God specifically called two men to lead out in the building of the sanctuary. You're probably aware of that. You've probably read that before. Their names are Bezalel and Aholiab to help build this sanctuary. 
What was special about these two men? What was special about them? One, uh, A, they were prophets. B, they were priests. C, they were skilled carpenters and craftsmen. Or D, they were filled with God's spirit and with wisdom. Which one was it? Toby. You know, some, I sometimes do that too. I have the urge, I want to raise my hand. I don't even know the answer. Which one was it, Toby? They were prophets? They were pre- What was it? D. How many of you agree with uh, this young scholar? Okay, yeah. And that's actually right. It was because they were filled with God's Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean they, they didn't have other talents. They were carpenters and, and skilled craftsmen. But God says about them that they were filled with His Spirit And they were given exceptional wisdom. And therefore, he said, let's have them lead out in the building of the sanctuary. Thank you for participating, quiz. I think God loves it when his children work hard and are successful. Do you believe that? I think he loves to give his people talents and skills and abilities with which to enjoy life and be happy. Isn't that true? That's why he's a good God. God loves to be gracious and merciful. One of the, I, th- I think one of the most interesting passages of Scripture and, and powerful is found in Micah 7.18 because of, of one phrase in particular. Micah 7.18 says, who is a God like you? And it's, it's a question. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity? See, the other gods didn't do that. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever. And here's the phrase, because he delights in loving kindness. Or in the King James, he delights in mercy. He delights in it. Now, we all appreciate forgiveness and mercy. We all appreciate compassion. And we all know that at times, we have to be merciful with one another. And we do it because of we, we know we have a responsibility to be compassionate and gracious. But we don't always love it. God loves to be merciful. He loves to be compassionate. He loves to be, ha- have a character, uh, the Bible says, uh, he delights in loving kindness. And that's a unique thing about God. He delights in mercy. He gives us so many talents and abilities, and God gives a special outpouring of his spirit and his wisdom upon those he calls to build and sustain his sanctuary, or in our New Testament context, the church. God does not give us talents and skills and abilities. He does not give us the Holy Spirit just so that we can keep it to ourselves. Just so that we can do great things, build great monuments, build great successes to our own name and to our own benefit. How many of you brought your Bibles? Would you do me a favor? Would you hold up your Bibles if you brought it? Hold it up. Come on, hold it up. Be like Ellen White. Hold it up for what, 30 minutes? No. I see a few phones If you have a smartphone, you have a Bible. There's no reason why you can't download several free versions of the... You can put them down now. Thank you. Uh, You know, one great New Year resolution um, among many that we could have, bring your Bibles to church. Is that... That's not asking too much, is it? Bring your Bibles to church. Let's let's look up the scriptures together. We'll have uh, PowerPoints from time to time. We'll have scriptures uh, up on the screen and in other ways... Uh, for sure, but there's just something about having your own Bible and knowing on which page a passage is and, and having your own pen and highlighter to write in the notes or to underline passages. Can we make that a resolution together? How many of you will say, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make a commitment and pledge that I'm going to bring my Bible to church? So let me see your hands. Uh, a finger doesn't count, Ben. I need to see the hand up in the air. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's going to be wonderful. If you have your Bibles, Exodus 31 is where I'm going to invite you to turn. Exodus chapter 31. That's in your Old Testament, right after the book of Genesis. And uh, we're going to be reading several verses of Exodus 31 and uh, 
seeing what the Lord has in store for us. Before I begin reading the passage, though, uh, I'd like to pray one more time. Will you join me? God in heaven, we've uh, said many prayers here today, and all of them are important. Father, I just want to add one more prayer that you would truly bless this time that we have together. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word and through your spirit that there are so many inadequacies that I possess, Lord. I pray that it would not be an obstacle to your message going forth today. So, Father, just bless this time that we have together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses is on the mountain. He's on Sinai. He's been communing with the Lord. He has received, to a degree, the Ten Commandments. He doesn't have the tablets yet. He'll get them later. But God has written the law down. And he's been giving other various instructions and commandments and decrees. And we come to, he's given the explanation of the sanctuary to Moses already. But now he comes to the construction part in Exodus 31. And that's where I want to focus uh, together this morning. Exodus 31 and verse 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Uh, I generally do, by the way. Most of the uh, uh, time that I preach, uh, I use the New American Standard I'll refer to other Bibles from time to time. I mention that because a few have asked, and uh, I really like the New American Standard for many reasons, and I'll point that out in just a minute as well. Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Now, we're familiar with Hur, probably, Hur was one of the men that held up Moses' arms, Aaron and Hur, during the battle with the Amalekites when Joshua was fighting. And when Moses' arms went down, they began to lose the battle. And so Aaron and Hur lifted up Moses' arms. So we're familiar with Hur. And so this is the grandson of Hur, Bezalel. God says, I've called him by name. His name, by the way, means shadow of God or in the shadow of God, or might rightly be interpreted as under the protection of God. Of God. Anytime you see a Hebrew name ending in E-L, that is the shortened version of Elohim, the name of God, or the title God is included in the name, and the rest of the name means shadow. So it's a good name, under the protection or in the shadow of God. Verse 3, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. And then he says, uh, he gives four qualities that uh, come as part of, of having the Spirit of God in him. He says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship. And, and, and just if I can get a little technical here for a second, if I can get a little wonkish, if you like. Um, this is one reason why I like the New American Standard, because I actually went into, uh, into the Hebrew, and I did find that all four terms are included in wisdom, in knowledge in understanding and in skills and craftsmanship. Many Bibles leave out wisdom, and I don't know why. It's a very simple Hebrew word. Um, the, the NIV, which is a good Bible, leaves it out, doesn't mention it. The new uh, Revised Standard Version doesn't mention it. They only mention three qualities. The English Standard Version leaves out wisdom. I don't know why. Now, I've gone into some of the Bible notes. You know, when they translate a Bible, the translators will give you the reasons for why they translated certain passages one way or another, and you can look at it. And I'm not going to tell you which Bible version it is, but I went into the um, translator notes for one of them, and they simply said, we left out wisdom because we didn't think it applied. Well, you got to be careful. We need wisdom in reading our Bibles, don't we? And so um, I like the fact that the New American Standard uh, continues to retain all four qualities that the Masoretic Hebrew text has had in it for over a thousand years. And I don't see any reason to leave it out. And it'll become important later in our study of this passage uh, as we move along. Other pa Bible translations, the New Living Translation, another one I really like, and your King James and New King James still retain uh, wisdom, and I, I, I'm glad that they do that. But God says, this guy, I've called him by name. His name means under the shadow of God, in the protection of God. And I have filled him with my spirit. And, I've, and along with that has come wisdom and understanding, knowledge, and all kinds of craftsmanship. And then he goes on to describe 
uh, what he will be doing with these skills. To make artistic designs, verse says, uh, for, uh, verse 4 says, uh, for work in gold and silver and bronze, and in the cutting of stones and the settings and the carving of wood, and that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. And, uh, be, and then he mentions another guy. Verse 6, and behold, I myself have appointed. And God wants to make it very clear to Moses, it's my decision here. Okay, this is not a vote. This is not, you know, you go out and say, can I have some volunteers? Okay, this is God saying, I have selected for uh, specific purposes two individuals. Behold, I myself have appointed with him, with Bezalel, Aholiab, the son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill that they may make all that I have commanded you. Now, Aholiab, his name means father's tent or tent of the father. And again, the last two letters of his name, the A-B, you remember your New Testament, those who cry out, Abba, Father, Abba, Av means father, okay? In Hebrew, you can either pronounce it with a B or a V, okay? Ab or Av means father, and the rest of it means tent. So it's tent of the father or father's tent. And I think that's an appropriate name. If you're asking uh, the children of Israel to build a tent, for the father, why not choose the guy whose name means tent of the father? And that, that makes sense. God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? But remember, the concept of God being their father was not as readily understood to them at that time as it is to us now. After 400 years of, uh, 400 years of slavery in Egypt, Israel lost much of its truth about God's nature and his relationship with his people. And it's not until Deuteronomy that Moses has to gently reintroduce the concept to his own people that he is really, truly their father. So it, it is somewhat profound, somewhat uh, 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 symbolic that God is trying to reintroduce to his people who have forgotten who he truly is, that he is in, in actuality their father in heaven. That's why the first thing that Jesus told his disciples when they said, how should we pray? We don't even know how to pray. How, how do we do it? The first thing Jesus said in his model prayer he gives us is our father, our father, because it's so easily forgotten and misunderstood. Our father, and Oholiab means father's tent. It's fun to learn people's names, isn't it? There's lessons that can be learned in that. Well, what were these uh, skilled craftsmen going to do? What were Bezalel and Oholiab, uh, what was their task? The, the passage continues in, in verse 7. They were going to make the tent of meeting. And then all seven articles of the furniture of the tent are enumerated here. The Ark of the Testimony and the Mercy Seat upon it. And those are, although they go together to make one Ark of the Covenant, God makes a distinction between the two. The Ark of the Testimony and the Mercy Seat upon it. And all the furniture of the tent, the table also with its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with its utensils, and the laver in its stand. That's all seven of the major articles of furniture that you find in the, t in the sanctuary. That's a... That's a pretty significant task that they have then. It goes on, everything else related to the sanctuary. The woven garments, verse 10 as well. The holy garments for Aaron and the priests, the garments of the sons which were to carry on the priesthood, the anointing oil also, and the fragment in incense for the holy place. They are to make them according to all that I have commanded you. I find it interesting that even in the building, even in the construction, even in the gathering of the materials and the, the artisans designed for the sanctuary, God said not just anybody can participate in that task. They have to have my Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. It's essential. If it's missing, they can't, they can't be effective. It's not going to work out. And I have called by name. I have appointed I have established beforehand. They may not have even understood that this would be their task. But I have called them by name. I've appointed them. God wants it understood that the work of the sanctuary, everything from its building, its maintenance, and its services is sacred to the Lord. Everything about the work of the sanctuary is sacred. 
Nothing was to be treated as simply common or ordinary. The workmen were especially called, gifted, and named by God. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, in verse 6, he says, In the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill. I take the responsibility for what's going to take place in the building and the putting together and the construction of this sanctuary. There is no more important work on planet Earth than the work of the sanctuary. There's nothing more important than the sanctuary. The sanctuary was God's answer to the problem of sin. You know that, don't you? The sanctuary was what allowed God to be with his people. He said, let them build me a dwelling place that I may be among them. Without the sanctuary, Israel was separated from its God. It was the physical representation of the lesson of righteousness by, righteousness by faith. There was nothing more important to Israel than the sanctuary. The sanctuary was to teach all mankind about Christ, about his mission, his work, and his great sacrifice for our sins. It had priority. The sanctuary was holy. It was separate. It was divine. It was spiritual. It was not to be taken lightly. The sanctuary was a gift to be treasured by all, yet under the watch care and stewardship of the people of Israel. They were not to hoard it to themselves. It's a tragic fact that when uh, the sanctuary is eventually transitioned into the temple in Israel, that uh, the Israelites in their confusion of God's command and in their corruption of understanding what he had done for them, they put barriers preventing certain people from coming too close to the sanctuary. You had the court of the Jews. The Jews, of course, had the most intimate access. Thank you. Had the most intimate access. They could go the deepest into the sanctuary. Jewish men, that is. Then they had the women and children's court. And the women and children, they could come, uh, if, you, if they were Jewish, they could come quite close, but not quite as close as Jewish men. And then you had the court of the Gentiles. And the, court of the, and the Gentiles, they had to stay even further back. And, you know, they have excavated and archaeology has found some of the pillars and some of the gates that barred people's access. And one of them that they found, this is Herod's temple now in the first century um, before it was destroyed by Titus. They've actually found the inscription that the Jews put on that gate. You want to know what the inscription says? In it, it, and this is a, a paraphrase, by the way. But it says, any Gentile who crosses this gate does so at the peril of his own life. In other words, if you were a Jew, you had the right to kill a Gentile who happened to wander too far into the sanctuary. Isn't that tragic? Isn't that awful? Is that what God designs for his, his sanctuary? Is that what God, want, God wants for this place that was supposed to educate people about Christ and his mission? Of course not. Now all need to approach with reverence and instruction and, and, and uh, you know, humility. But to set up those kinds of barriers was never God's intention. The sanctuary was sacred. And all were invited to participate and to understand its function for them. The work of the sanctuary is sacred to God in all of its forms. Secondly, God is pleased to pour out his Holy Spirit. He is pleased. He enjoys. He loves to give his Holy Spirit to those he's called to work in his service. Amen? He gives the needed gifts, skills, abilities, and wisdom and talents. I know you hear it often, and it is somewhat cliche and, and, and simplistic, and I understand it. I understand that it's simplistic, but I think it's ultimately true. God does not call the qualified. What's the rest of that go? He qualifies the called, okay? If we wanted to wait for God to call the qualified, no one would ever get called because in the work of God, nobody has, without God, nobody has what it takes to do the work that God calls us to do apart from God, okay? We all need his Holy Spirit. 
So he calls us, he fills us with his Holy Spirit. Now, of course, God combines natural talent with spiritual. I don't think that Bezalel and Holiab were dentists or taxidermists before this event, and then they just woke up one day, and the Holy Spirit was in them, and they said, hey, I can build a sanctuary now, okay? I think that they were already carpenters and craftsmen when they were slaves in Egypt, and God combined the natural God-given talent that he'd already given them with this new spiritual uh, talent and ability that he wanted them to have for the building and maintenance of the sanctuary. Clearly, God works with those things already in us, but he perfects them and purifies them for his purpose. I like how it says it in Desire of Ages. It says, all who consecrate soul body and spirit to God will be constantly receiving a new endowment of physical and mental power. How many of you ever feel like you need a new refreshing in physical and mental power? Any of you ever just get a little tired? A few of you, the rest of you are so tired you can't even put your hands up. That's right. As you consecrate your soul, your body, your spirit to God, you will constantly receive new power. Did you know that? It's a gift from God. The inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at their command. Christ gives them breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. The Holy Spirit puts forth his highest energies to work in heart and mind. The grace of God enlarges and multiplies multiplies their faculties. And every perfection of the divine nature comes to their assistance in the work of of saving souls. Like I said from the beginning, God doesn't give us the Holy Spirit. He doesn't give us talents and abilities. He doesn't give us skill and all kinds of knowledge just so that we can build our own temporal monuments or build our own kingdoms here on earth. When it comes to the saving of souls and the work of the sanctuary, the work of the church, God gives to each and every individual that which they need to be successful. He says, I've called you by name. I myself have appointed you. Every perfection of the divine nature comes to your assistance in the work of saving souls. Do you think that's enough? I think that's enough. We should never say, uh, uh, well, I've got my natural skills and abilities. Oh, and I've got the Holy Spirit and God on this side. If only I had a little more, then I could get it done. That leaves out excuses, doesn't it? That leaves out excuses. Through cooperation with Christ, they are complete in Him. And in their human weakness... In their human weakness, they are enabled to do the deeds of omnipotence. Boy, I tell you, you want another New Year's resolution? I got a whole slurry of them. Read Desire of Ages again. There is just so much power and and beauty. Through cooperation with Christ, you are complete in Him. And in your human weaknesses, you are. Yes, you. Yes, you're weak. Yes, you have inadequacies. Yes, you lack in all kinds of qualities. But through through cooperation with Christ, you can do the deeds of omnipotence. I think so, yeah. Amen. The work of the sanctuary is sacred. It requires the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, of course, the sanctuary was Old Testament. It's, uh, it's the shadow that has now uh, passed away and has reached its fulfillment in Christ. So this no longer applies to the church, right? You know, I find it interesting. Uh, turn over with me in your Bibles to Acts, Acts chapter 6. I have just the hint of a cold coming on. And of course, that's the reason why I'm, I'm mispronouncing things, of course, because I would never naturally do that. But it is giving me a bit of a challenge. In the work of the sanctuary, some would serve as priests, some would build and maintain the structure, some would give of their abundance, but all would worship there. 
all would come, all would benefit from the sanctuary. The whole congregation had to work together to make the sanctuary work. In, in the New Testament, as the church is just in, in its infancy, they were having to realize that the sanctuary in its earthly form, the temple as it functioned, ha- had really ceased to have its, uh, its necessity as far as a physical manifestation. God had told the disciples, the day is coming when not a single stone will stand upon another here in the temple. You won't have the temple. It's going to be gone. What you have now is me. Is me. And, and, and by the way, that's better. But for a culture and a religion that had spent a thousand years developing and building and becoming dependent upon the, the, the services and the function of the sanctuary, this was quite a revelation. This was quite new. They weren't quite sure how to organize themselves, how to build the church. And the Holy Spirit had to come at Pentecost, and there had to be all kinds of instruction coming from the Lord to instruct the New Testament church how to operate and how to come together. And so we come to Acts chapter 6, a passage that we're probably also familiar with, but I want you to see it in connection with Exodus 31. You recall the story here in verse 1. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, praise God, the church was growing. And it caused all kinds of problems. But praise God, the church was growing. They were increasing in number. Uh, But a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews, those are the Greek uh, Jews, against the native Hebrew Jews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. That's racism. You, You notice that? They were racist. No, I'm not being pejorative. I'm not being. I'm not embellishing either. That's exactly what this is. This is racism. We haven't conquered it yet, have we? As civilized, as intelligent, uh, uh, as a people as we are, um, in our society, we still struggle with racism, don't we? And the early church struggled with it as well. What a challenge! Talk about something that could derail the New Testament church. Talk about something that could drive a wedge, just be, it could almost stop the church growth in its tracks right then and right there. Boy, did they need wisdom back then. We need it today. So the 12, verse 2, summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, look, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now, you can read that a couple of different ways, but understand it at least in this context. The disciples knew that they could not do everything for the New Testament church. They could not be everywhere and be everyone, everyone's helper at the same time. They knew they needed help. And I imagine at this point, through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and through the gift that God had endowed them with, they saw their role in the New Testament church something like a Moses. Okay? They saw themselves as needing to be the leaders in prayer, the leaders in delivering the word. And they would need helpers. And just as Jethro had to come to Moses and say, look, the work is too great for you. You need to appoint other people to help you in the work. Those 12 disciples said, we need to find other people to help in this work. And listen to verse 3 to how, um, oh, I haven't got there yet. I haven't finished verse 2 yet. It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Yes, I did. Verse 3, therefore, brethren, Select from among you seven men of good reputation. Now listen to the description. Full of the Spirit and of wisdom. Whom we may put in charge of this task. Now why do I point that out? You might think that that phrase, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, is everywhere in the Bible. That God uses that very easily, very, very casually. Everyone's supposed to be filled with the Spirit and wisdom. Not true. Only 13 verses in all the Bible put that phrase together. Full of the Spirit and wisdom, or full of the Spirit of wisdom, or the Spirit of God and wisdom, or any of those cognates. Only 13 times. One of those times we read about in Exodus 31. That Bezalel was one of those individuals that God had said, I have filled him with my spirit and I have given him wisdom. 
And I think it was that passage. I think that Peter and the other disciples uh, there in Acts chapter 6 are specifically referencing what Moses, the instruction that Moses received in Exodus 31 in the development of the leadership structure that would build up and maintain and sustain the church. And that's why I'm glad my New American Standard Bible includes the word wisdom in Exodus 31. I think it's important. I think Peter uses that word later on in Acts chapter 6. There are only three other individuals in all of Scripture that are said to be filled with the Spirit and of wisdom. Did you know that? Only three. Now, I'm not saying it's not inferred and intended in many other circumstances and settings. I think it is. Surely, we all want the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes along with that, don't we? That's not reserved for a few, but from a strictly uh, uh, you know, verbal standpoint, only three other individuals are said to be filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. One is the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 11, and that makes sense, right? He's the fullness of all, and, and he has a uh, 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 the completeness of God in his character, absolutely. The other two are Joshua and Daniel in uh, Deuteronomy 34 and Daniel chapter 5. I just throw that out there. Make of it what you will. So the New Testament said, when it comes to the sustaining of the work of the church, we need the same quality. We need the same type of individual that God called when it came to the construction of the sanctuary in the Old Testament. We are now building a New Testament sanctuary, and it's called the church, and we need people to be filled with that same spirit of wisdom. It won't work. It'll fail unless they have that. Every single one of you who came up here and stood on this platform, you cannot do your work without the Holy Spirit. And what a a tragedy when we try. What a tragedy when it's so available. This is the selection of the deacons. You recognize that in Acts chapter 6. They're not called deacons here, but this is the historical record that we understand to be the very first establishment of deacons. What does the word deacon mean? No. It actually means servant. Servant. The New Testament church needed servants. And I submit to you today that just as there was no more important structure on earth in the Old Testament as that sanctuary. And I know this sounds very vain. I know this sounds very arrogant. But I believe it's true. There is no more important structure on earth today than the church. It is the bride of Christ. It is imperfect, isn't it? It's got its wrinkles. It's got its flaws. It's got its racists in it, doesn't it? It's got its problems. Be that as it may, it is still the institution and organization and structure through which God has empowered and and filled with his Holy Spirit to bring a fallen world back to a Savior who died for it. It's not about four walls as much as it is about what's happening in the hearts of the people who comprise the church. Is the Holy Spirit in your heart? You know, uh, Priscilla mentioned it, and I just appreciate the passion that she has for prayer in this church. We are having 10 days of prayer. Why can't you come? What's going to prevent you from being there? What is so important in your life that you cannot gather with your church family and dedicate your heart to God? You might not be able to come all 10 nights, but why can't you be there most of the nights? Can you, can you answer that one? Not to me. I'm not asking you to tell me. That's between you and the Lord. It's between you and the Lord. But what an opportunity for us as a church to gather And ask the Lord for his Holy Spirit. 
We cannot succeed without it. We need the wisdom. We need the skill. We need the understanding. We need the craftsmanship from those who do the most simple jobs in the church. I don't care if it's vacuuming the carpets or if it's preaching the word on the pulpit. We need everyone to have the spirit of God in them. And we will be ready for that Pentecost. We will be ready for that outpouring. Every task that sustains the church is sacred. Every class, every ministry, every Bible study, every work be, every service and ceremony is holy, sacred, and blessed. And all of us, we all need the indwelling of God's spirit to rightly perform this task. How we need his wisdom, how we need him, and how available he is. He loves, he loves, he loves to give us the spirit. He loves it when we ask for the spirit. And I think we should ask. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, I pray that you would challenge all of our hearts, Lord. No matter where we are, what capacity we serve, that you would make this year a renewed year of commitment to you that we would seek your face, that we would seek your spirit on a daily basis, and that we would take advantage of those opportunities within the church to unite with our brothers and sisters in prayer and study and all kinds of activities, even social activities, Lord. And we know that the, the church is an invisible thing. It's not just about this uh, physical structure, Lord. It is about the spiritual union that we have with you and with each other. So, Father, as we begin this year, this is the first Sabbath of 2015. Lord, may this be the first time, if we haven't made it already, that we commit to asking your Holy Spirit to guide us for this year. We pray in Jesus' name.